Hello there! In this video, I'm going to talk about hierarchical task networks. There are two types of tasks in hierarchical task networks, primitive and compound. Primitive tasks are where the actual actions are. They have preconditions which define if the task is valid, effects which are used during planning to define their end state, and an operator that's the action to be executed. Compound tasks have a set of methods which work as conditional branches that are chosen during planning. Methods have preconditions, like the ones in primitive tasks, and a set of tasks. These tasks can be either primitive or compound, and that's what allows the hierarchical nature of task networks. When creating your AI, you need to define a compound task to be your domain's root. The connected tasks is what we call a domain, which represents what it means to be the NPC. During planning, all compound tasks are decomposed into their primitives, and this list of primitives is what we call a plan. Each agent will have their own planner. The planner will use a domain and also a world state. The world state is a representation of the game's state. And what this means is that it only contains the data that's relevant to your AI. So let's say your NPC has an energy meter, and in your AI, you just need to know if the NPC is tired or not. You could use the actual value from the meter and inside your AI check if it's below the threshold. But that would make things more complex and require constant recalculation. Instead, what is usually done is to make the comparison outside the AI and set to the world state only what's needed. Your world state will be a simplified projection and the pieces of logic that keep this projection up to date are called sensors. You can have sensors inside your NPC to check for energy and health. You can have areas to detect if the player is nearby. Your sensors might even be connected to the global state, for example, to check if it's night or day. That's it for the world state. Now let's talk about planning. There are three cases that will trigger planning. If there is no plan set, which will likely only happen when the agent is first created. If the current plan is complete, either finished or failed. And if there is a change in the world state. The plan starts by the root of the domain. It checks the method's conditions against a copy of the world state. The first method to pass the checks will be chosen. Then it iterates over the method's task. If it's a primitive task, it's going to check its conditions against the world state. And if it passes the checks, it applies the facts to the state. By applying the facts, we will make sure that all following tasks will consider those chains. But as I mentioned before, this is just a copy of the world state, so no actual chains are made to the original state. If the task is a compound task, we will do the same thing we did to the root. Every time a method is chosen, a copy of the world state is created and stacked. This makes it easier to keep track and revert chains if you require it. For example, when going through a method's tasks, some tasks might pass the conditions and have its effects applied to the state. If one task fails after this, the method is considered invalid, so the tasks need to be dropped from the plan and the chain is reverted from the state. This can be easily done by dropping the state copy completely. The next method will be picked using a new clean copy of the world state. This keeps going and every time a method fails, it's reverted. When it succeeds though, its tasks are added to the plan. By the end of the planning, we will either have an empty plan because all methods failed, or a list of primitive tasks. Now the agent just needs to execute these tasks. Now let me show you how I implemented this in Godot. This time, I decided to create the project in 3D. As it was my first time doing 3D, I picked Kenny's 3D platformer Starter Kit. It's very likely you already know about Kenny, but if you don't, they have a bunch of free assets to help people get started. I hadn't used their stuff before, but I was not disappointed. It works quite well. I also want to give a shout to Seth, which sent me an email suggesting looking into hierarchical task networks. Sure, it took me way too long to get started, but thanks Seth for the suggestion and the nice discussion about the AI patterns. So let me execute this thing here. Yeah, so the NPC um, has a few different tasks. So the default one is that it roams around, as you see, and uh, yeah, it just keeps going to random places and stop there. Uh, I also spawn some coins every now and then, and the NPC goes there and collects the coins, you see. So another thing it does is that if I get too close, it looks at me. So this takes precedence of the other thing, so it just keeps looking at me. If I jump when I'm too close, the NPC gets scared and it tries to run away from me, so you just watch it. Ooh, yeah, so uh, it's just that I, well, yeah, now there's a coin, so after running away, it gets back to its normal task. Um, again, like there's another coin there, so if I move around, it's gonna go and pick the coin. If I get close, uh, well, you pick the coin before I got close. So uh, another thing is that if I jump, uh, if I scare the NPC like three times, so this was two, I think, I think it's three times, uh, it gets tired. So if I jump again, yeah, you see that now it's just standing there, those particles coming from their head, and it doesn't, it's kind of a resting over there. Uh, after it comes back uh, to normal, it's gonna go for the coin, you see. It usually goes for the closest coin, and then, um, yeah, that's what it does. And I think that's all the behavior for this one. Um, 
So I do have another example that that he, that has many agents at the same time. So I can execute this one. So yeah. So you see, um, can I show all of them? I don't. Know. Let me go to the corner. So they are all spread out, I guess. Uh, but yeah. So you see, like there, there are at least four, I think. Yeah. So when they see a coin, they go for the closest one. Um, and then, yeah, this is what they do. And you can see they are moving independently. Uh, they also get scared independently. I mean, uh, those two, they're gonna get scared. Yeah, so yeah, so, and you see how they, they do go for the closest one, so that's why the ones far away were going to, to the other coin. So it's the same behavior, it's just that here, I'm showing you that uh, they work independently, so that one got targeted. Yeah, and I can pick the coin before they do, actually. Uh, yeah, so that's it, that, that's the behavior. Uh, I went for something simple. And now, uh, let me show you the scripts that make those things possible. In scenes, you can find the, the two different scenes, like the, the main one and the one with multiple agents. There isn't really anything special in the scene, it's just like the number of uh, NPCs in it that changes. Uh, if I open the NPC, the NPC has a planner and sense state inside it. For the planner, it's just a node and I can uh, hook to the actor and a domain, this is a script. And um, yeah, sensors, same thing. It hooks to an actor and then hooks to the planner. So I did it like that because it doesn't really need to be inside the NPC. I can have a dumb NPC and have those two being set in another scene. And this is useful if you use your NPC model to all this stuff, like for portraits or uh, background characters that won't have any behavior at all. So all scripts related to uh, the Hyacol test network is under the HTM folder. So just check this one out. And uh, I separated by core sensors and tasks, which are uh, the implementations for um, the tasks for the AI. Uh, so in the core one, um, let me start with maybe the, the base task, the simplest one. Uh, well, the base task actually is just a, it just works as a namespace. So the primitive task I define just as task, this is the whole task. And uh, those are the methods uh, that are gonna be extended. So I have one for effects that will just return a dictionary with key values. And I also have the set of preconditions, which is also a dictionary with key value. I'm going to talk about the limitation of implementing like I did here in a minute, but uh, to keep going. So execute is the method that is the, the operator. This is where the logic is going to be implemented. And uh, let me show you one example here. So if I open implementation uh, primitives and um, let's go to target position. So it has a precondition, it has, has target true. And then as a fact is has target false because this means it's like reached the position. So I just update the uh, world state with has target false. And then here's the operator. And the operator receives a delta and an actor. Um, and again, this is my implementation. Maybe this can be implemented in different ways. I get the target from the actor. And then uh, if the target is null, it means there is nothing to go to. So it's just gonna return a failure. Uh, and then if the target is there, it calls the actor with uh, move towards target. And uh, yeah, and then I check if the position, uh, if the distance is uh, lower than one. Uh, after that, I set the target null, and that's basically what has target false means, setting it a null. Uh, and this is just a, a print, I guess, like a left here, so just remove it. Uh, yeah, and then return success. If it hasn't reached the target, it's just gonna return processing. And uh, because it returns processing, this means that uh, whoever is executing this planner knows that, oh yeah, it's processing. So in the next tick, it's gonna, again, send the delta and the actor, and uh, keeps doing this until it gets either success or failure. Yeah, and this is the basic implementation for the primitive task. So now let's uh, check the, the other one, the, compound task. So uh, a compound task only has a get methods that returns a list of methods. And again, I think it's easier to see the real implementation. So I'll get this one, do random idle actions. For, so for this one, you see, I have like a, two methods. And again, they are named method one and method two, just for this example, just uh, simplify stuff. But obviously you should give more meaningful names to your methods. So you don't have uh, problems like if you, I don't know, if you need two to come first or if you need another one just in the middle. Also, I could have declared these inside here. Uh, but yeah, these are all design decisions that are not tied to the implementation. So uh, this can be changed. And this is uh, the list of uh, preconditions. Like those are the tasks you're going to execute. So set closest coin target, go to target position, and goes to idle. You see that I'm reusing here uh, the same scripts. Yeah, okay, coming back here to the method. Let me talk a little bit about the preconditions and uh, how it appeared here. So um, in my implementation, I just went with a declarative approach where I just defined like uh, these key values. Uh, the limitation of this one is that um, those are will always be a end operation. So if I have two preconditions here, like are there coins in the world? And is in coin collection to down? This is a and, it means this and this. And from my experiment so far, this is enough, but it, it might be a case where we need more complex preconditions. Like if, what if we want to R, or what if we want to do a comparison, like greater than, lower than? Well, you can find some pattern. And if, if you ever watch you know, other tools like MongoDB, you're probably used to this kind of a, a design where you can have like a special keyword like R and then uh, anything inside this keyword would be uh, a R. So in this case here, it could be one or the other. And by default, it's always an end. So if I have here banana, uh, yellow, <laughs> whatever, this is an end, this or this, and this. And the same would apply for, I don't know, greater than. We could have like coins in the world. We would have something like a key that would be 
coins in the world. I don't know, like, a, what was it? And then the value of that, I don't know, 100. Uh, yeah, this is one way of going through, uh, this way. But also uh, another way, and that's also not uncommon, is by going with some uh, lambda function or, um, yeah, some kind of a methods to check the conditions. And it could be something like this. It could be like, uh, it needs to receive the world state in this case. And then, uh, world state, yeah. And then we, I think you also need this. And it does return true here. And then um, you could do something. This would allow you to go programmatically and do something. Oh yeah, that value in this case, if it's this and uh, the other one. So yeah, and then you do return true. Well, in this case here, uh, yeah, I just otherwise return false. So in this case here, I just did very declarative, but obviously you could, because your return true and false, we just do return here, and uh, that would be equivalent to this one. But, uh, oh, I think I, I deleted like a, a comma. This this one does work, so I can just remove this and put a, a comma here, and you see that the syntax kind of has. So yeah, this one uh, should work, and this would allow you to do more complex um, operations without really having to implement your own your own pattern here. But uh, when I was implementing these, I, I, just, I just thought this was a little bit too verbose or um, a little bit too convoluted, and uh, Obviously, you can always move these outside this as well. So you can have it, let's say, in this case here. So you can have these outside as well. So, sorry, the editor seems to be jumping around. I think this is a, um, it's, well, my line's too long, so I guess that's why. So, yeah, so, but what I'm trying to say is that you can have some something like method one preconditions, and then in here, you just do this. Method one preconditions. Yeah, so uh, those are different ways you can do this, and uh, it's up to you in your implementation. As I said, I just like the, this declarative way because it just looks cleaner to me. Yeah, so this is the compound task. This is how my methods are declared. Uh, so if I open the other one, the runaway one, you see um, this one just have one method. And sometimes you might just want to have uh, a compound task just to abstract something that can be reused. Yeah, another compound task I can show you is the domain itself. So um, yeah, so this is the BAMPC domain, so the, the domain being used uh, in my MPC planner. And um, as I mentioned, the domain, the root, the entry point for the domain is just a compound task. And this one specifically has four methods. Uh, and this is an example where you can have either compound tasks or primitive tasks in your uh, compound task. So <laughs> this is just defining the behavior you saw in my example. So now let me show you the planner for this one. So this is the planner and um, there are a few things going on here, uh, but it's not too complicated. So when the node is instantiated, I do some setup. That's basically uh, things like the world state, like connecting to the state change in the world state, which will trigger a uh, a plan. So if I open here, you see this is a plan that's triggered by uh, the world state change. Um, there's also the setup domain, because uh, as I show you this node here, it used a BMPC script. So this one is just uh, instantiating that script. And the plan runner is what's gonna uh, execute the plan. I initialize it with the same world state as the planner and uh, the same uh, actor as well. And then I'm also listening to the plan finished signal because this is what is the cue for the, the planner to uh, execute the plan again. So if I go to this callback, uh, you see it also triggers a planning. And yeah, as I mentioned, there are three cases where the plan is recalculated, when the state changes, when the plan is finished, but also when there is no plan set. And, and in my case, this is only true when I'm first creating the MPC. The plan is actually just uh, three methods. You see, like those three methods is uh, everything I implemented for the plan. So this is what uh, is doing the planning logic. And even though at first it might look complicated, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, starting with the plan, like the entry point, the planning. Uh, the first thing I do is initializing the working state. And if I go to this method here, you'll see it's just like initializing this stack. Like I was talking about how we keep doing copies of the world state. So this is how I do it. So I have um, one thing to initialize the stack. I have this one that gets uh, the latest, latest thing in that stack. And uh, this one is to save a new copy to the stack. And this one is to remove the latest copy from the stack. And uh, well, this could be in its own uh, script, I guess. But it, so I just kept it here because it's simple enough. Uh, coming back to the plan. Um, so the root is just a compound task. So I'm calling the method to decompose a compound task. That's going to get the list of primitive tasks in that compound task. So uh, if I open this one here, um, I get the list of methods. I get the current working state. And then I iterate over the methods, checking uh, the conditions. So checking conditions is pretty much what the primitive task was doing, where I just compare the conditions against the world state. This is the place you would have to change if you were to implement the, the extra comparison logic, like or or greater than. Going with the flow, uh, if the method passes checks, we save the current working state. So this is just, again, uh, pushing to the array of uh, the, the state stack. Um, and then I do a decompose task because uh, remember a compound task might have either a primitive or a compound task. So I also need to make sure that all those tasks are primitive. So, so in the decompose tasks, um, I'm creating an array of decomposed tasks. That basically, it's supposed to be the least primitive tasks. Um, and then uh, I also get the current state and then I go through um, the, the tasks. So let me first uh, talk about the primitive task. I check if it's available. This is the thing that checks the preconditions against uh, the world state. If it passes the check, I apply this effect to the world state. 
and then uh, I add the task to the decomposed list of tasks. And I keep going. So every time it finds a pivot task, it's gonna to add to this list of decomposed tasks. Well, if it finds a compound task, then it calls the decomposed compound task again. So this is basically recursion. So it's gonna call the same method that's called for the root here. It's gonna go through the methods. It's gonna uh, duplicate the well state if required, and then decompose its own tasks. So in, in case of the decomposed task here, uh, that's calling the decomposed compound task, uh, if it's zero, uh, if there are no tasks, I just return an empty array. Uh, otherwise, it appends the task from the compound task to the decomposed task array. This will make sure that by the end of this execution here, all the inner compound tasks were decomposed and added to this array. Eventually, it's going to run out of tasks. When that happens, it returns the decomposed tasks array that will have all the primitive tasks uh, in that method. So when it returns the list here, uh, this one is checking if the, the list is zero, because if it's zero, it means that none of the primitive tasks press the check. So it's going to uh, restore to the previous state and continue as just a keyword to go to the next loop in the form. So uh, yeah, it's going to keep doing this. It's going to check the next method and uh, until it gets a method that returns a task. So if the method returns the task, it just uh, uh, return the decomposed task that came from, from here. Once it finished the execution, it's going to go all the way back to the plan. If the plan has uh, tasks in it, um, th these are just sprints for my own debugging, but I just set the new plan to the plan runner. Right, and th that's the planning step, but that's it. The plan runner, let me show you the plan runner now. In the plan runner, you see I do this process here. The process is just making sure that there are tasks available. If there are tasks, it execute the current task. And again, I have this list of tasks. Um, they call execute, which is the operator in that task, passing the delta and axio, and then I get the result back. If it's processing, it doesn't do anything, just keeps going, the next tick is gonna go through the same task. Uh, if it's a failure, I finish the plan, and finishing the plan is basically uh, cleaning all the tasks, and then I just immediately the signal that the plan was finished. If it's a success, then do a new task. It basically removes the current task from the, uh, the plan, from the array of tasks. Uh, if the plan is empty, it means that it's finished, so it's gonna notify. If it's not, it's gonna keep going, and uh, remember I said that the tasks are checked if there's still available, because uh, sometimes like a plan, it might be a long plan, and it might take a long time until it weeks, like a task, so maybe there are conditions that are not met anymore. So just making sure that this plan is still valid. And then it, it keeps going. It's like a, executing the, the current task, then it's just basically calling the operator. Um, that's the basic implementation, and I think this is uh, everything um, you need to have this going. And um, I really liked to implement this one, actually, from all the game AI patterns. Um, this was actually one of the simplest ones, and um, I really hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, just leave in the comments. Also, if you like these game AI patterns, I have some older videos about behavior trees, goal-oriented, action planning, and uh, utility AIs. You can also find me on Twitter and Macedon, and the code for this sample is on my GitHub. That should give you some good insights if you want to implement it yourself. Also, feel free to use it as is. Uh, I haven't tested in scale, so uh, you might run into some bugs, but I, I think it's a good start if you want to do something like that in Godot. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. Um, see you around.